Heavenly Father, in whom alone dwells the fullness of light and wisdom. Illuminate our minds, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, in the true understanding of your word. Give us grace to receive it with reverence and sincere humility. May it lead us to put, your, put our whole trust in you alone, and so to serve and honor you, so that we may glorify your name and edify our neighbors by our godly example. Since you are pleased to number us among your people, enable and dispose us to give you the love and honor that we owe as children to our Father and as servants to our Lord. Amen. Hi, good morning. Uh, we will now continue in our series on uh, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. In chapter 3, verses 11 through uh, 13. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Hear then the reading of God's word. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this portion of your word that we are about to unpack. We humbly ask for wisdom and for your guidance as we look to your word. We ask that you speak to us through the preaching of your word. We ask all these in Christ. Amen. Love is one of the cliches in Christianity. But it is a hard thing to do or achieve. In Paul's prayer, which we have just read, we are told to increase and abound in love for one another. Perhaps we say, okay, it's hard, but I can do it. For one another, for one another and for all. Now, that is a hard thing to do. All means literally everyone. You mean to say, I should love not only my churchmates or my fellow believer? And yes, that's hard, right? All? That's hard. Why? Why do you think it's hard? To love all people, including those whom you don't know. That's a hard thing to do. But that is what Paul asks God for the Thessalonian Christians. That we must also desire and ask God to do to us. To increase 
and abound in love for one another and for all. Last month, we saw how Paul badly wanted to be with the Thessalonian Christians. He wanted to be with them, to minister to them in person as they were in the midst of affliction. Also, he wanted to be with them even in their rejoicing because of Timothy's uh, good report that they were doing good as they go through ordeals. We have seen in this letter how Paul and Silas have deeply cared for them, for they loved them, and they became very dear to them. The Word of God tells us that God can make us increase and abound in love for one another so that we may be established as blameless in the holiness before Him when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And so we have three headings this morning which will serve as our guides as we unpack this portion of God's Word. You can also find them uh, on our bulletin. Number one, the addressee. God the Father and the Lord Jesus in verse 11. Number two, the heart. Abound in love for one another and for all in verses 11 and 12. And number three, the goal, hearts established blameless before God at Christ's coming. So number one, the addressee of the prayer, of Paul's prayer. Number two, the heart of the prayer. And number three, the goal of the prayer. Now, for the kids... Take note of these three uh, keywords for you. Number one, God. Paul prayed to God in the person of the Father and of the Son. The Father and the Son are one. God is one being in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Number two, love. The main wish of Paul is for the Thessalonian Christians to increase and overflow in love for one another and for all, which will result into something when Christ returns. And that is our third keyword, holy. Number three, holy. Paul wanted the Thessalonian Christians to be blameless in holiness before God. When Christ, when Christ returns. Number one, God. Number two, love. And number three, holy. Let us go first to our first heading, the addressee of Paul's prayer. God the Father and the Lord Jesus. Now, we pray only to God. We pray only to God. He is sovereign. He is all-powerful. With Him, nothing is impossible. And He does what is according to His will. He does whatever He pleases. God is the only one who can help us in the moment of our miseries, finiteness, and inability. In connection to that, we pray only to God, not to Mary, nor the saints, nor to Allah, because they are not God. The Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Also, the Westminster Confession tells us, There is but one only, 
living, and true God. The Belgic Confession. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God. We pray only to God. Now in connection to that, here, Paul addressed the Lord Jesus Christ as well in his prayer. He prayed to Him. What does it mean? It means that He is God. Look at verse 11. Now may our God and Father Himself, He prays to the Father, He asks the Father. And we see here that He also prays to, our, he prays to or asks the Lord Jesus. He says, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Paul addressed not only the Father in his prayer, but also the Lord Jesus. He can help him in his inability at that moment. And so he asks him, he prays to him. He knows that the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, are one, as we are told by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself in John chapter 8, verse 30. God is one in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul here prayed to God because he can't do anything at the moment. He can't come to Thessalonica. And so he prays to God for the Thessalonians. There is a tendency for preachers or for those who stand in the pulpit like me. And yes, this is a very good reminder for me. There is a tendency for us to rely on our preaching and teaching at the expense of neglecting the importance of of entrusting to God whatever we do. There are times when we can do anything. There are things which we cannot do. We cannot change your hearts and transform you. We cannot make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. Even if we preach excellent sermons, unless God uses our sermons, our preaching, and work in the lives of the people, their hearts will not be changed. Paul cannot do anything this at this moment I mean yeah they did something they sent Timothy because they cannot uh, enter Thessalonica they, and so they sent Timothy to minister to the Thessalonian Christians but he knew that only God can make a way parang song pala yun God can cross their paths with the Thessalonians. His helpless condition drove him down on bended knees before our sovereign and gracious God, who alone can help him and do something in that instance. In verse 11, he asks, May our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. To all of us, there are and there will be bad circumstances when we can do is only to pray and trust in God's goodness, mercy, and sovereignty. 
But what do we do when those circumstances come? Does it drive us down on bended knees before God? Or anxiety eats us alive? To the point that we don't pray at all. For us who teach and preach, we cannot transform people. Even if we prepare excellent teaching and preaching materials. Only God can transform them. Only God can make them increase and abound in love for one another. And this should cause us all the more to ask God's help. To pray. That leads us to our second heading. The heart of Paul's prayer. Number two, the heart abound in love for one another and for all. Since he cannot come to Thessalonica to minister to the Thessalonian Christians in person, he asks God to work in them. In verse 11, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. Loving people with whom we have disagreement is difficult, even if they're Christians like us. Christians, perhaps Christians from other denominations and, uh, or traditions. Even the anti-reformed Christians. It is also possible that we find it hard to love people even from our own reformed tradition. People whom we agree with theologically, but we don't like them personally. There are also times when it is you and me whom they find it hard to love. It is easier to show no love at all to people. We can say that, well, I don't love him actively, but I don't hate him as well. Like passively. Neutral lang. Like, no love at all, and no hate at all. Zero. Yes, we cannot measure love. Like water, like air, or sound. So, for those who used or did some kind of measuring love, like love o meter, love calculator or flames. Wala naman siguro hanggang ngayon na nagaganyan. I've been thinking of a better way to say it, but I can't think of one. But that's nonsense. Well, I love you guys, so I want to tell you the truth. The point is, we cannot measure love like uh, math mathematically. But here in Paul's prayer, he wishes, may the Lord make them increase and abound in love. Paul is not talking about arithmetic like volume, speed, and decibels. He's not setting a number he actually wished that the Thessalonian Christians increase in love to the point that our love abounds. That it overflows because it is uncontainable. And our love that Paul asks God to increase and to abound, to overflow, is for one another and for all. Now it becomes much harder to do when we include all people. 
He asks God to make our love increase to the point that it overflows from us and spills to one another like how vessels of water overflows and spills water all over the place because the faucet keeps on running and keeps on adding water to it. Now, what is love? A song din po pala Love is one of the most, if not the most cliché thing in Christianity. But what is love, really? Of course, we should look at love in the Scripture, not what love is according to the world. In Scripture, love does, love does and does not. In Scripture, love does and does not. It causes us to do what is right and to refrain from doing what is wrong. Love does what is right unconditionally and does not do wrong. Love does something. It does what is right unconditionally. Paul spoke of labor of love in this letter in chapter 1 verse 3. He says, love labors. It loves to do things for the one who is loved. We express love when we do things for those we love, right? Pag sinundo mo ang yung, yung brother mo because he can barely walk. That's love, right? You show your love to the church by participating and caring for its members. If you look after your brothers and sisters in the Lord, that's love right there. Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, verse 12, verses 12 and 13, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Great, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. Now, we can do things out of love, but it doesn't mean that that what we're doing is right and holy. But we are told, love does what is right. Also, love does not do wrong. Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. If you love your brother or sister, you will not deceive him or her. If you love your brother, you will, cause, you will not cause him to sin. If you love your brother, you will not tolerate him. Brothers and sisters, Paul did not just pray to the Father and to the Lord Jesus for us to love one another. But the Lord Jesus Himself taught His disciples as well to love one another. And not only did He teach them to love one another, but He also is the perfect exam example of love. And He is Himself love because He is God. And he displayed love for his people when he died on the cross. And there he bore our sins. He gave his life as a ransom for sin, for our sin, because he loves those who believe in him. 
He was buried and was raised from the dead on the third day. He ascended into the right hand of the throne of the Father. And He is coming again to judge the living and the dead. So if you're not a Christian, we rejoice that you are here. And now you're hearing the good news preached. I want to tell you that you need a loving Savior. You need Jesus Christ to save you from sin and its eternal punishment. Therefore, repent of your sins and believe in Him and you will be saved. And for, all, for those who believe, the Word of God tells us to love one another as Christ loved us, which leads us to our third heading, the goal of Paul's prayer. Hearts established blameless before God at Christ's coming in verse 13. Our salvation from sin and its punishment by grace and its punishment. Sorry, our salvation by grace through faith in Christ brings fruit in us by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit now sanctifies those who believe and our sanctification includes loving one another and all people. And that is what Paul prayed about. In verse 11, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. Do you see how Paul relates our love for others to our holy living, to our sanctification? Loving others is connected to our godly living. We often think of loving others as only for other people, for those whom we love, and that it does not affect us personally. But our love for others also helps us to see our sanctification. Jesus tells the disciples in John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Our speech, our thoughts, and our treatment of others tell us about our sanctification. Of course, if we speak of, think of, and treat others badly, it means bad for, our, for us. If we speak of, think of, and treat others well, then that means that we are walking in a manner worthy of the gospel of God's grace, which we have received. Maybe we don't treat people badly like what others do. But there are times that it is a matter of the heart. When we discuss things, whether in social media or in person, without love and only for the sake of being right or winning the argument, that's nothing. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 and 2, if we speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith 
So as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Paul's prayer in verse 13, that, he may, that God may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God, does not mean that we are and we can be blameless in this life. He's referring to our Christian or godly living as those whom God has made holy through Christ. We have been made holy, not because we are in ourselves holy, but because of Christ's holiness. And because of Him, we are now enabled to live a godly life by the Spirit who sanctifies us. Thus, our sanctification, specifically our love for one another and for all, is an evidence of the work of the Spirit and of our salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And this is the goal of Paul's prayer for the, Thess for the Thessalonian Christians. That at Christ's coming, they may be established as blameless in holiness before God. Loving, having a love, an increased love that overflows, which is an evidence of their salvation. In addition, as God's people in the last days, our godly conduct and living is always in view of Christ's return. He will surely return to deliver us from the wrath to come. But I ask you this question, are you truly a Christian? Is the sanctifying work of God by the Spirit evident in us? Brothers and sisters in the Lord, Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians must be desired to happen to every believer in every time and in every place. May we increase and overflow, abound in love for one another, that our hearts may be established blameless in holiness before God in view of Christ's coming. Again, for those who are not Christians, this is the time for you to repent of your sins and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. For He will surely return. And when He returns, those who do not believe in Him will be punished in eternal lake of fire. And those who believe, He will take, He will take us with Him to the new heaven, to the new heavens and the new earth. And there, will, and there we will have fellowship with our loving Savior. So come to Jesus. Come to Him. By faith, He is a loving Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the remi reminder <clears throat> that we have received from Your Word. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave Himself up for us He died on the cross so that we may be saved from our sins. And we often fall short. We do not love others. So Father, we ask that you would cause us to 
increase and abound to overflow in love for one another and for all. We ask all these in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kim. You know, sometimes we would have a brother who's interested in.